हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे बोल श्री गुरुदेव की जय श्री प्रोपाद की जय गुरु परंपरा की जय सर्व संतन हरि भक्त वृंदन की जय समस्त ब्रजवासी भक्त वृंद की जय कोल करताल की जाए हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जाए श्री राम अनुजाचार्य अतिथि महामहोत्सव की जाए गो प्रमानंदी हरि हरि वो टुडे वी आर ऑनरिंग श्री राम अनुजाचार्य इज अस्पिशियस फेस्टिवल डे टुडे वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग हिज लाइफ एंड हिज ग्लोरीज Vaishnavira Gunagan Kodile Jivaratran by glorifying the Vaishnavas the eternal associates of Shri Hari our lives are made successful Jivaratran our lives are fully successful Who are the Vaishnavas Nakarma Bandanam Janma Vaishnavanam cha vidyate Vishnu anucharatvam hi moksha mahur manishana Nakarma Bandhanam Janma the Vaishnavas are the messengers of Lord Krishna the supreme personality of Godhead they come to this world as his emissaries to inculcate the people of this world with true spiritual values and knowledge of the soul relationship with God and help bring them to their true spiritual destiny therefore they are not bound by the laws of karma as ordinary living entities in this world <clears throat> Shri Ramanujacharya epitomizes this conception of the messenger of the Lord Vishnu Anuchara someone who is following the desire of the Lord who is subordinate to the will of God and is a ambassador of his divine message So Ramanujacharya means Rama Anuja Anuja is like the younger brother of Lord Ram So as we understand it from our Vaishnav teachers Ramanuja Acharya is an incarnation of Lakshman Lakshman is the brother of Lord Ram the younger brother So therefore he is also an incarnation of Sri Baladev who is Lakshman non different Baladev is the brother of Krishna Ram and Lakshman are brothers similarly Krishna and Balaram are brothers Lakshman was the younger brother however so he desired not to be the younger brother because in the past times of Lord Ram he had to perform many duties which were very difficult such as he was re- requested by Ram instructed by his elder brother bring firewood to set a pyre for Sita Devi to test her chastity he did not like this later Ram told him take Sita Devi to Valmiki's ashram far away from Ayodhya Dham So because of these reasons he said oh I was the younger brother I had to follow your instructions <laughs> let me be Baladev in our next incarnation I'll be uh, the elder brother So I can always look after Krishna with Krishna he has the mood of sakya friendship but also vatsalya like a parent he has that paternal affection for Krishna But Ramanuja Acharya he is considering himself I am the simple humble servant of the Lord Even though Balaram is the elder brother he is considering himself always as a servant of Krishna Ashraya Jatiya Bhagavan even though he is like non different from God self manifestation of Krishna still he is Ashraya Jatiya in the category of being the servant of the Lord this is Baladev Tatva So Ramanuja Acharya is coming from Lakshman coming from Baladev Ananta Shesh therefore he is a very powerful acharya teacher in the line of Gaudiya Vaishnavism We'll hear a little bit about the teachings he gave. His philosophy is known as Vaishista Dvaitavad. This is based on the philosophy given in the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. Ramanuja Acharya wrote commentaries on these three important works. All of the Upanishads he gave commentary, the most prominent Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, spoken word directly by Sri Krishna. supreme personality and the brahma sutras the vedanta 
Sarva Vedanta Saram. He, Srimad Bhagavatam Ishite. The Vedanta is the end of all knowledge. The completion of all Vedic study is the culmination, the crest jewel, the apex, is the Vedanta. So Ramanujacharya established commentaries on these three major works or scriptures. And he, unless you have commentary on these three scriptures, you're not considered to be an authoritative Vaishnava school. So his Vaishista Dvaita philosophy is, was propounded based on these three works or scriptures, Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutras, and the Upanishads. And they're all connected. Bhagavad Gita is Sarva Upanishad Agavo, the essence of all the Upanishads. And Bhagavad Gita also says, Sarva Vedanta Krit, Veda Vedam Chaham, that I am the essence of the Vedanta. And the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, to understand this in more detail, study the Vedanta. So these things are connected. So the Vajista Dvaita philosophy he taught is very important. We'll go about that further. Some important things to remember about his life, we'll discuss uh, in the previous talk we discussed about in relation to Guru Darsha and some of the pastimes of Ramanujacharya as it came up in that biography of Srila Gurudev. So we won't repeat those pastimes. When he was very young, he was born as one of the great saints of South India. His teacher in his childhood was a impersonalist known as Yadava Prakash. So he studied with him in school and he would challenge him actually because by nature he was a devotee and the devotees it's described to be very painful for them to hear the descriptions that oh god is actually not real he's just uh, formless or we are that we are the same as god this is very painful for the devotee to hear it's described to be like beating the chest of the devotee because they have a personal relationship with God. So for you to tell them, no, God doesn't exist, or it's just like a formless, formless void, or a light, or actually we are all just God, but we've forgotten it. It's very uh, hard to hear for the devotee. So one time when his guru was teaching him, Yadav Prakash, he would, the Mayavadis tend to denigrate the form of the Lord. So that he was describing one sort of, Sutra or aphorism of the Vedic scriptures, Kapyasam. And he described that this is, this is a description of Vishnu, Lord Vishnu. And he said Kapyasam means that his eyes are like the color of a backside of a monkey. So hearing this, Ramanujacharya was very disturbed and began to weep in the class. He could not tolerate that. And his Guru Maharaj saw this and was thinking, why is that? Most of his students, you know, they didn't have so much devotion. They just heard it and giggled or laughed. But Ramanujacharya could not tolerate. His heart was burning in agony. He began to weep. And his Guru Maharaj said, why are you disturbed? He said, oh, if I have your permission, I would like to say something. So he said, what do you have to say? At that time he stood up and very powerfully, very boldly, even though he was a young child, he said, this is completely erroneous conception you have given. And your whole interpretation of the scripture in favor of impersonalism is false. Kapyasam does not mean the backside of a monkey. Kapyasam. It means when what is receiving, see, because with Sanskrit, there's many ways you can interpret the words. Because according to how you join the words, the conjunctions. So Kapyasam, in one derogatory sense, you could say it sound, it's like the backside of a monkey. But it's a very derogatory way of interpreting. Rather, he said, kapyasa means that which receives um, power, effulgence, energy from the sun, the lotus in the water. And when that blossoms, it has a reddish color. And it's more suitable as an interpretation for this verse because it, it is how the aphorism is constructed, the verbal roots. It means this. It can very easily be shown to mean this. But also the Lord's lo our eyes are lotus-like. Very beautiful, like a lotus petal shape. And so it makes sense that it's describing his eyes to be like a reddish, uh, around his eyes, this very beautiful reddish glow. Like when a lotus blossoms, golden lotus, and the tips are reddish colored with the light of the sun. So this is the verse describing the beauty of the Lord's lotus eyes. So when he spoke so beautifully, 
in a long, elaborate way, glorifying the Lord, uh, his guru was feeling a little bit uh, put down, you know, denigrated. So he wasn't pleased with that. And this kind of became a recurring event where, you know, the young boy would, uh, his name at that time also was Lakshman. So he would counter his, his gurus or his teachers' uh, analogies or his kind of philosophical conclusions. And he didn't appreciate that. And it became so bad, actually, he, his envy grew so much. Actually, it said that those who are impersonalists, who are trying to become God or thinking they are God, they're, they're full of envy by nature. And so they want to be God. They are envious of his position. And if there are devotees or anyone who is superior to them, then they become very envious. So he actually plotted to kill Ramanujacharya when he was a boy. And he arranged they were going on a school trip. And he had a plot that they would uh, strand him out in the woods, separate him, and then they had arranged some way to kill him, actually. To, you know, drown him in a raging river like that. So some of the close boys who were like the teacher's pets and who also didn't like him, they were plotting like this. Now, by God's mercy and his will, the cousin of Ramanujacharya's name was Govinda. And he heard of the plot while they were on this trip. And so he told Ramanujacharya, oh, you have to escape. They're going to kill you. So at that time, Ramanujacharya, late at night, he said, oh, I'm going for a walk with my friend. And he snuck away and ran into the woods. But it was a dark, late night. And even though he had a lantern, quickly went out. He didn't know which way to go. At that time, he saw a hunter and his wife walking nearby him. And they approached him and said, oh, are you lost? He said, yes, I'm lost. So they helped him out of that forest and brought him back to his town where he was from. And he was feeling very indebted to them. And he, he, there was a very miraculous uh, event from that time. And so he realized, actually, this was uh, none other than Lakshmi Narayan, the Lord and his consort Lakshmi. Because afterwards, you know, they took him to the border and then they disappeared. And so they had appeared just to protect their devotee. Mare Krishna, Rake Ke, Rake Krishna, Mare Ke. The Vaishnavas are fearless because they know that no one can harm you if it's not your time. And ultimately, they know the soul is eternal. You cannot harm the soul. Krishna describes in great detail in the Bhagavad Gita, the soul cannot be harmed. A foolish person thinks, I am slain or I am a killer. I am either the killer or I am killed. The material body is already dead. It's just going on its course by karma because the soul is present within it. As soon as the soul leaves, the body is dead. It's dead matter. It's inert. Judd. So we cannot be killed or be, or be the killer. It's just the body. It's nothing to do with the soul. The Vaishnavas know that. But also, for this body, if someone wants to kill you, but it's not your destiny, not your karma, no one can harm you. So the Vaishnavas are not afraid. Therefore, Lord Vishnu directly protected Prahlad. Especially it said, Mare Krishna. If God, you know, if God wants you dead, no one can save you. But if God wants to protect you, no one can harm you. So in this way, Lakshmi Narayan themselves protected this boy. Later on, when the Guru, Yadava Prakash, came back, he found that Ramanujacharya was still alive. His name was Lakshman Deshik. So he became uh, very astonished what to do. And he didn't want the word to get out. So he acted like everything was normal and he had him come back to school. But again, it was kind of continuing on in this way. So gradually it became you know, apparent that it wasn't going to be resolved very easily. But Ramanujacharya quickly, he desired to go and um, take shelter of his transcendental guru. There's different levels of guru. Someone is like a family guru, a teacher. But then there's some personality who is on that topmost paramount level of devotion, either as an eternal associate of the Lord, having come to this world to help us, or like a greatly empowered teacher or preacher. So that personality at that time was known as Yamunacharya. 
He was a very great saintly devotee who was establishing bhakti, this mood of devotion to the Lord in a personal way. So at that time, Ramanujachari wanted to take shelter of him. And actually, he became quite famous in his own way in that area because he established his own, when he was growing up then, he started establishing his own school teaching devotion, bhakti, and he had his own followers there. So Yamunachari was very attracted to him because it said that um, the guru ultimately knows the, his disciple. Even before one becomes his disciple, they have this relationship. It's a spiritual relationship. So he wanted Ramanujachari to come to him. So this was going on. At the same time, uh, Raman, Yamunachari was very old at that time. So he was looking who will be a successor to my mission. And he was praying that he would come. At that time, he sent different of his disciples to come and bring Ramanujachari to him. And so, in due course, Ramanujachari came to take shelter of Sri Yamunacharya. But, by the will of the Lord, Yamunacharya just passed away right before Ramanujacharya arrived. Therefore, it was very saddening for Ramanujacharya. He was very disturbed, very when he arrived to meet his guru, his transcendental guru, he was being taken on his uh, on procession around that area, giving darshan of all the temples and places he had established, and people giving people a chance to offer their respects to him. And he, they were preparing for his samadhi, but he had three fingers closed. And so Ramanuja Acharya thought, now it's his three final desires that his prominent disciples told him that he wanted, he was waiting for you to come. He was very eager for you to come. He was hearing you were going to come. So he had three desires remaining. So Ramanujachari took a vow that I will fulfill these three desires. That was to establish the proper commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, the Upanishads, to establish Vaishnava Mariada, and to preach very powerfully and established temples. So, as he was saying this, it was like his fingers were opening and his desires were fulfilled. To take sannyas, he said, I will take sannyas and preach. I will establish Vaishnav Grantas, I will establish temples. And this philosophy of Vaishista Dvaita. At that time in India, there was controversy over which philosophy and interpretation of the scriptures was legitimate. And most prominent in that time was the teaching of Sankaracharya, Adi Sankar, who is an incarnation of Lord Shiva, sent by the Lord to preach impersonalism or Mayavad. The idea that ultimately we are all God, this world is false, and we have to come out of illusion and realize we're God. That's his philosophy, and it's very, it was very prevalent because it's the kind of thing that people like to believe. Oh, the suffering in this world is not real. Ultimately, I'm God. I just have to wake up and realize it, and then I can be God and have all his opulences and enjoy. So it's a, it's a very uh, it's a easy sell philosophy. But the Vaishnavacharyas came specifically to smash that conception and establish the pure conception of Sanatana Dharma or Vaishnav Dharma, which is synonymous with Bhakti. Real Bhakti is the eternal nature of the soul. These cheating philosophies cannot give real satisfaction and happiness to the soul. It's, a, it's, it's like a mirage. Oh, you are God, you are God, you are God. You think you're going to be happy thinking like that. But you struggle towards that goal of achieving Godhood and freeing yourself from the illusion in samsara, but because you can never achieve that position, uh, it's a check that cannot be cashed. It's like a false check. Oh, I got this check worth you know, $10 million. I just got to go cash it in the bank. The I am God check. But when you go to cash it, you know, at the end of your life, it comes back and it just bounces. So Vaishnavism and Bhakti Yoga is the thing that can really give happiness and satisfaction to the self because by nature we're seeking relationship, a loving relationship. And by nature we are Anu Chaitanya. We are finite consciousness, individuals. And God is the absolute. It's called the universal soul by Ramanujacharya, Brihad Chaitanya. And so therefore by nature we are part of that supreme whole and our natural 
tendency is to serve in love or devotion, that supreme entity. That is called Bhakti Yoga, the union through devotion with the Supreme Absolute Truth. So Ramanujachari took a vow, I will smash the Mayavadi conception and I will preach very powerfully this Vaishnava Dharma. First, however, he actually took shelter of many of his godbrothers and disciples of his guru, understanding their place and their wanting to take shelter of them and to study from them because he didn't have so much time. He didn't have any time really with his guru directly. And so he wanted to study from his god brothers and he served them all personally. This is one of the things he showed in his life, the importance of respecting and honoring all god brothers, god sisters. So he served them all and he pleased them all, all the personal servants, sevaks and prominent disciples of his guru. He served them personally for a long time. And with their blessings and with their recommendation, he took on the position of the acharya or the preceptor of that lineage. At that time, he began to very powerfully preach. So he began to establish his philosophy of Vishistha Dvaitavad. We'll discuss that. Also, some things he established which were very important. We know there's the caste system in India. And the caste system... It's based on a principle that has legitimacy in its proper application. However, it's used or misused to gain a position without the qualification or without performing the service that is required for that position. So Ramanuja Shai was against this, the idea that, oh, only those who are born as Brahmins or in Brahmin families, they can perform puja, they can be priests, they can be gurus. He was one of those who objected to this and began to preach that bhakti is uh, for everyone. Relationship with God is the innate nature of every living entity. All souls are intrinsically one with and different from the Lord. One with in quality, different in quantity. The Lord is vast and we are minute but we are of that same essence consciousness bliss eternal existence and our nature is to unite ourselves with the lord through bhakti through devotion in a relationship with him so ramanuja acharya taught two things prominently he taught bhakti devotion and within bhakti he emphasized prapati or prapanna the mood of surrendering atma nivedana in bhakti there are nine limbs that are prominent, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshipping the Lord's lotus feet or his devotees or his abodes, the Dham, Palasevanam, Archanam, worshipping directly, Sakyam, developing a mood of friendship, Vandanam, offering prayers, Atmani Vedanam, surrendering the self completely. So he gave a lot of emphasis on this mood of surrender. And within surrender, we know there's six limbs within Sharanagati or surrender. That surrendering is described to be the doorway or the entrance into bhakti. If we're not able to follow these things, we're not really following bhakti. We may be developing some pious merits, some sukriti, doing some seva, serving the sadhus, the saintly people. It helps us advance in life to real bhakti, but we must surrender. So those six limbs of Sharanagati or surrender are Anukuliyasa Sankalpa, taking a vow to follow what is favorable for my spiritual growth. Pratikulya Sevarjanam, giving up those things which are unfavorable to my spiritual growth. Atnukulya Sankalpa, Pratikulya Sevarjanam, Rakshisati Divishvaso, the faith that God will protect me, that He is my protector. Gopi Tvevaranang Mata, that the faith that God is my maintainer. I am not having faith in, oh, the government is my maintainer, my family, society, or my own strength. No. I am surrendered to the Lord as He likes. He will maintain me and I will act only for His pleasure. Gopi Tve Varnangdata Atmanik Shepa Karpanya Mood of humility and surrender to the Lord. Sadanga Sharnagati These are the six stims or limbs of surrender. So Ramanujacharya strongly preached these things. In his philosophy, Actually, when he was preaching about this idea that everyone can serve God and it's not, there's no barrier of race, caste, creed, gender. We're all the servants of God and we all have that eligibility. 
Ramanujachari had experience in his previous, in his householder life, how his wife had the attitude, even though he was a very high class Brahmin, his wife had an attitude, oh, I'm such a high class Brahmini, and she would criticize and abuse those who were of a lower stature or position in society. So this caste system, this rigid caste system, was there prevalent in India. And Ramanujacharya helped to break down this. He did not say, okay, if you're a Brahmin, you're not a Brahmin. Give respect to the Brahmins. Give respect to everyone according to the position. But Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, guna karma vibhagasa. Krishna himself says, chaturvida, that chaturvarnya mayashristam, the four varnas, or the stratification of society into social orders, according to one's qualification and action, that is the proper way, and it's natural. By people's qualification, one person, it's a meritocracy. If one person has the qualification to become like a Brahmin, then they should be given that opportunity. It's equality of opportunity, really. It's a meritocracy. If someone has the qualities of study, devotion, helping being a teacher, helping others do these you know, performances of a Brahmin, then he can be given this initiation and become a Brahmin. Kshatri, if someone is naturally like a warrior or like an administrator, he can enter that role. If someone is a Shudra, like a laborer, they can perform that role. Someone is like a Vaishya, a merchant, they can perform that role. It's according to one's guna and karma, qualities and action. When he was teaching his philosophy, there were many, uh, I'll just go over a little bit the rest of his philosophy and then discuss some of the things that actually the priests in the temple, they were so antagonistic towards him, they tried to poison him. So we see many great saints in their lives, how they are attacked and vilified for what they do. When he was a boy even, they tried to kill him. And then when he was a great Acharya teacher, they gave him the remnants of the deity, the prashad, and they put poison in it to try to kill him. And again, he was protected by the Lord. They were bringing him some sweets. And one of these fell off the plate. And a dog that was in that area, between the temple you know, and the out, outer areas, ate one of those and immediately fell dead. And he saw, oh, they were trying to poison him. Another time, they tried again. But one of the wives, actually, of the Pujari heard and found out and informed the Sevak of Ramanujachari and protected him. So many times people are against us. Our Gurudev would say that when, when you try to preach the unadulterated truth, people will become against you. That does not mean you should water down the truth or make it in such a way to be palatable to those who are filled with anartas, desires and tendencies which are opposed to devotion. So therefore, Ramanucharya boldly preached without thinking, oh, people will become disturbed, maybe I should make it more palatable for them. Satyam bruyat, the priyam bruyat. You should speak the truth even if unpalatable. So Ramanujacharya was an example of that. Our, our, Param, our you could say, Parameshti Guru, Shla Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, he spoke on over 108 of the instructions of Ramanujacharya, and he spoke on his life many, many times. And he took inspiration from him, especially how he preached fearlessly. Because Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada also, he preached in such a powerful way, people tried to take his life. He also gave Brahmin initiation to those who were not born as Brahmins. But if you don't have any of the qualities of a Brahmin, you're described to be Brahma Bandhu, only like a friend of the Brahmins. You're not truly a Brahmin. Therefore, it's more determined by one's internal quality. So Vaishista Dvaita, Vaishista Dvaita is very important teaching. It means that we are everything. Actually, he was the main proponent of what you could call unity and diversity. That everything is ultimately of that same one essence, or source, or the Brahman, or Sri Vishnu. It's come, everything is coming from the absolute truth, and that is one. Ekam Dutiyanasti, there is no second, it is one. Advaya Gyan Paratadva, the non dual absolute truth. However, within that oneness, there are specialities. That is called Vashista. So it is Vashista Dvaitavat, qualified monism. This is what he preached. So he preached that there are three eternal substances or three truths. 
That is Parabrahman, the Absolute Truth, Supreme Personality. From him comes the Brahman, the effulgence, his effulgence of his personal form, the impersonal expanse of the effulgence. So that is the Brahman. Parabrahman is the first. Second is Jiva Brahman, the living entity, which is also a quality of the Supreme Absolute Truth. And Achit, Chit and Achit Brahman, meaning the living entities like us, our consciousness, by our consciousness, it's described the consciousness is the quality of the self, the soul. So we are the Chit Brahman, then there is the Achit, dead matter. Dead matter is not the same as the so self, the conscious entity. The microphone is dead matter. It's not the same as, it's not a conscious entity. But the person who is that force by which we are able to see, to hear, to smell, to speak, that is the soul, and that is the Chit. So these three things are there. The purpose of our life is to try to develop relationship with the Absolute Truth and achieve emancipation from illusion in samsara and a relationship with the Lord in the true spiritual sense. This is called moksha, mukti. The real mukti being relationship directly with God. The next thing he taught is that there are three ways to understand the truth. They are called the pramans, three evidences. The first is Shruti, the authoritative scriptures, the Upanishads, the Vedas, the Brahma Sutras. These are revealed knowledge. Second is Anuman. It means logical inference or anything that any conclusion that can come through, logical analysis of things. The third is Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means direct perception. And that can include uh, scientific, anything uh, realized through use of different tools for experiments or the scientific process. So these three evidences are there. In the rank of hierarchy, the topmost is the Shruti, direct um, revealed knowledge. Next is inference, Anuman, or what you can come to through logical conclusions. And third is direct perception or the scientific method. However, if the scientific method or direct perception sometimes contradicts with something that is logically uh, assumed or inferred, then direct perception has uh, rank, you could say. It has, um, you know, you cannot counter it. But ultimately, our, because our senses are limited, they cannot give us the complete perception of the absolute truth. Therefore, we rely upon Shruti or the Praman, that is, the scripture. The highest evidence is the Vedic scriptures. Authorized the Vedic scriptures revealed by God himself. So these are the three kinds of evidences. So Sri Ramanujacharya taught these three kinds of evidence. It's important to understand. First one is the Sastra. The authorized scripture. Not that anyone can write a book and say this is Sastra. That's not, you know, oh, I wrote a book that's Sastra. No. Whatever is directly revealed, revealed knowledge. It's described to be the Vedic rishis, the smritis, that revealed through their heart, they manifested, or the shrutis described to be revealed directly by God, like Bhagavad Gita. These are the authority, these are the topmost authority. And then through logical analysis, you can come to conclusion. And finally, through direct perception. So these things teach us that there is the soul, there is this world and there is God. The self and this world are described to be like the qualities of the Godhood. That's called Vaishista, like an adjective. Like if you were to say the horse, you can qualify it by saying it's a white horse, it's a black horse, it's a brown horse. So these are the Vaishistas or the qualities. Or you could say the car, you know, the car is red, the car is white, the car is a Mercedes, the car is a BMW, the car is a Ford. Those are kind of, you're distinguishing it by defining its qualities. So the, the individual souls and this material world itself are described to be like the qualities of that absolute truth. Obviously, his teaching is very um, elaborate. And so, you know, we won't, you could study that for a long time. He wrote commentaries on... Vedanta Sutra, Sri Basya, which became very famous. He wrote commentaries on Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. And in this way, he began to preach very powerfully, established 
hundreds of centers. If you go to South India, you can find his temples are very beautiful. Actually, there they have this style of temple with the Gopuram. It's a very large entrance gate, hundreds of feet sometimes high, very elaborately decorated with carvings, very beautifully, uh, colorfully painted. And the Lord is described to reside there as Sri Vamandev. That's one of the reasons why the Gopuram is very large, because one of the Lord's incarnations, Vishnu, is Vamandev, and he resides above the gate. This was um, the instruction, actually the boon given to Bali Maharaj, that you stay there so that whenever anyone comes, they take, have to take shelter of your lotus feet. So that's one of his requests. So therefore, in South India, we see the temples like that. When you go to Sri Rangam, it was one of the most famous temples there. There are seven walls. It's almost like its own enclosed city. And you pass through one, and in the first wall, there's markets and people living and houses, and gradually you get closer and closer into the sanctum. Just to see the form of the Lord there, the Lord is resting, Padmanabh, Ananta Padmanabh. And you can wait in line for hours just to get close enough to see him. And he has his small room there. It's not even so large, and you only have, you know, maybe a 20 foot walkway in front of him that the pilgrims kind of line up to go by. And when you see the Lord, the Lord's in like an obsidian, you know, very dark, effulgent form. And you feel, when you go and have his darshan, you feel very much so that you're like in the presence of the Lord. So he established this temple. He served in this temple and established many similar temples. There are many interesting pastimes of Ramanujacharya. He performed wondrous activities. Um, many of the kings at that time were followers of Lord Shiva, Shaivites. Chol Raja was one of the famous ones. And he was very antagonistic to Ramanujacharya because he was preaching Vaishnavism. So the followers of Shiva, even though they, they don't understand that Shiva is the topmost Vaishnav. The Bhagavatam says, Vaishnavanam yata shambhu. Shiva is the greatest Vaishnav. But yet they don't understand this and they worship him separately. So this is described to be one of the aparads. One of the offenses of the holy name is to consider Shiva and other demigods equal to Krishna or Vishnu. So the Chol Raja wanted to actually, he was another one who wanted to kill Ramanujacharya. And he plotted to do that. He would arrange debates and he would have his philosophers and his gurus preach his teachings, his tenets. And argue with Ramanujacharya, even though Ramanujacharya would clearly defeat them. Because he rigged it. He, you know, the, the, the arbitrators were on his side, you know. They could say it was one of the examples of a rigged exam or a rigged election, <laughs> a rigged test. And so he wanted to actually harm Ramanujacharya. So one time when he arranged one of these debates, because one time Ramanujacharya came and had a debate and he soundly defeated them, so the king was very upset. He thought, again, I'm going to invite him here to come, but this time... Afterwards, I'm going to declare him defeated. And I'm going to kill him. So one of his disciples' name was Kuresh. Close disciple of Ramanujachai. He had a brilliant mind. He had a, a memory that uh, Shruti Dar. He could hear something once or read something once and never forget it. So he was very intelligent and he studied all the teachings of his Gurudev, Ramanujacharya, and, therefore, and he could speak it perfectly. And he looked very similar to Ramanujacharya. So when he was... When he heard this plot of the Chol Raja king, the Shaiva follower, that he was going to kill his Gurudev, this is like now the third or fourth time someone tried to kill Ramanujacharya. He said, I will go instead of you. They won't be able to recognize I'll dress like you and you know we have a similar features. I think actually he was related. He was like a nephew or something. I don't remember exactly, but he was somehow related. So he went and he performed this debate and actually he was very clearly victorious but the king declared him defeated and he thought okay we don't want to directly kill him but what we'll do is they plucked out his eyes and they pushed him down a large it was like a cliff like a ravine and he you know they thought he would be killed by that not exactly like a cliff but you know like a ravine and he fell into that all the way down and he was blinded and crippled but anyhow he had so much devotion for his Gurudev, he continued on. And he would go everywhere just praising his Gurudev. Many years later, Ramanujacharya couldn't find him. But many years later, there's a long pastime. We told this pastime some days ago. How one of the lady disciples 
of Ramanujacharya got so much mercy from him. And Ramanujacharya was weeping in great devotion, uh, in great, uh, with great feeling, seeing her devotion. She had offered her own self just to serve her guru. She had put her life on the line. So Ramanujacharya was very, you know, indebted in a mood of great um, devo uh, love for her. Not love, but he was v uh, feeling very gr uh, a lot of gratitude. At that time, Kuresh, who is now like a cripple and blind, came in that area and Ramanujacharya saw him and embraced him with great, with great love, with great affection, and he gave him back his sight. So there are many interesting pastimes. Um, I don't know if we have so much time. There's a story of his, he had three disciples, he gave mystical powers. The Vaishnavas, when you follow Bhakti, all the mystic opulences and uh, cities, mystic powers follow behind you and ready to serve. So he gave, the kings didn't, he asked them for some wealth to try to erect temples for inspiring people in devotion and for having a place to worship. And they were not favorable to that. They would not help him at all. There was one king actually whose daughter became uh, possessed by a very powerful Brahma Rakshasa, very powerful spirit. And so they requested, later on his heart kind of changed and became a follower. And Ramanujachari came to kind of exercise that spirit. First he tried with his own gurus, his own teachers, and she beat them. She was um, in that possessed state, she was attacking them. And they could not, you know, defend themselves, even though they chanted all these mantras and everything. She said, only if Ramanujacharya comes, will I, uh, that spirit, leave your daughter, the princess, and she'll be okay. So they summoned him, and he performed uh, puja, did, gave Charnamrita, the Lord's footpath water, and she was freed. So at that time, he began to respect Ramanujacharya. But still, these kings didn't want to give any of their wealth. So Ramanujacharya made three disciples have the mystic power to steal all the wealth of the king. He made one, very small, so he could enter any place without being seen. He made one so that he could, was very strong, could lift anything and transport anything. And um, he made one that he could just walk across water also. Because the king had his treasury surrounded by a large moat. So he used these three disciples to steal all the wealth of the king. Almost all of his treasury. And then with that, he made these beautiful temples. So these are some of the, you know, the Vaishnavas. For the service of the Lord, it said, Manimitam kritam papam vidharmaya kalpate. Krishna says that even apparently sinful work done for my sake, upon my command or by, you know, the command of Sri Guru, that is actually dharma. But most people, you know, to imitate that, then, oh, not a, you will go to hell. You cannot imitate that. Oh, now we'll rob banks and, you know, use that in God's service. To imitate is, you know, it's not... We are not Shaktaves avatars, <laughs> empowered representatives of the Lord, able to do things like that. But Ramanujachar used that and he established big temples. Before he left, he took these three disciples on a, in like an ocean tour. Took them out by boat and said, now I'm going to leave soon. Before I leave, I want you to go to the spiritual realm and be ready to meet me there. They had so much faith in their guru that they accepted to give up their material bodies to go to the spiritual world. Lord Ram did a similar pastime. When he was leaving, everyone wanted to follow him when he was going to the spiritual world. He said, first I will enter into the Sarayu River. And if you want to follow me, you have to give up your bodies there. Because this material body cannot go to the spiritual kingdom. And everyone had so much faith in Lord Ram, they all entered into the river, gave up their material bodies, simultaneously achieved spiritual bodies. The scriptures say that when you perfect your life through devotion, at the time of giving up this body, simultaneously, like two lightning strikes, simultaneously, you'll achieve a spiritual form. That spiritual body does not decay, does not suffer, does not have disease and illness and old age. So Ramanujacharya, he, you know, did tilanjali. Tilanjali means to offer up, you know, to offer back. Because he said, if I go and you stay back, you may misuse these powers. Better you go first. And real disciples are very happy to do that. Oh, my Gurudev is going to leave soon. I don't want to live in this world without my Gurudev. And he's giving me an opportunity to go first, to be with him there. It's another thing we cannot imitate. 
you know, Ramanuja Chai was present, you know, I think 11th century. And so, you know, it's, you hear these kinds of things happen then. But, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, everyone's got to take Kool-Aid now and go to the spiritual world. Um, first of all, who, no one is of that power of Ramanuja Acharya. Ramanuja Acharya is directly like the brother of the Lord. So he has these kinds of powers. It's not something that, okay, all right, guys, <laughs> rob a bank. And if you get caught, no problem. And, you know, at the end, just, just take a cyanide pill and just bite into it and go back to God. It's not so easy. You know, it's not, don't think it's so easy. It's not such a cheap thing. But Ramanujachari had this power. And they had this faith also in him. When, before he left, he said, I am going to leave my body here. Because the bodies of the pure devotees, they are spiritual. Diksha kale, bhakta kale, atma samarpana. That when we really take diksha, diksha means spiritual birth. Diksham, diksha means divyang jnana yato dhadyat. Realization of one's spiritual form or transcendental knowledge of that relationship with God and one's spiritual form. And d destruction of all pap. But the pure devotees, their bodies are always pure. Krishna says, Stay deha karitar chidanandamoy. I make those bodies of my devotees transcendental. Therefore, they stay behind and they take samadhi and we worship them. Ordinary devotees or ordinary people, they are given cremation so that the soul is emancipated from attachment to that body and they don't become a ghost. But for pure devotees, there's no question of that. They're eternally the associates of the Lord. There's no question of becoming a ghost. So Ramanujacharya said he would leave his body in samadhi and he established a murti, but he also. You know, when you go to South India, you can see his form, his Morti form there, for thousands of years preserved, for over a thousand, like a thousand years now. And he said, any question you have, you can pray to me, and I will reveal the answer in your heart. And so people go there and they pray to him, and they are revealed these things in their hearts. So there's so many wonderful pastimes. We don't have time to talk about them all, but there's many beautiful, miraculous pastimes. Our Gurudev would describe these and weep seeing, you know, the examples of the devotion of his followers and also his pure example of bhakti or devotion. So many wonderful pastimes, he established so many grantas and so many qualified disciples. He very soundly established his philosophy and defeated the conception of Mayavad and in this way preached. And to this day, there's so many, you know, Vaishnavas now, you know, within Hinduism, because of the age of Kali, the age of darkness that we're in, many people, you know, they adhere to this philosophy of Mayavad and personalism, and they represent Hinduism as if it is a Mayavad philosophy. But really, Vaishnavas, between the different Sampradayas, Ramanujacharya followers, Madhvacharya followers, Vishnu Swami followers, Nimbadutya followers, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu followers, Vallabhacharya followers, there are hundreds of millions of Vaishnavas. They are the most prominent section of the followers of what is known today as Hinduism, of what a billion so-called followers of Hinduism, 400 million or more are Vaishnavas, the largest group. And then there's many, you know, Jains, and they also follow an incarnation of Vishnu. But then there's followers of Shiva, followers of Parvati or Durga, followers of impersonalism or Panchopasana. But really, followers of Lord Krishna or Vishnu are the most prominent. And he established through his teachings how the real truth is the Supreme Lord is Sri Vishnu or Krishna. He established this very powerfully in his teachings, in his commentaries, very deep philosophical commentaries with all kinds of evidences, logical, scriptural, perceptual, everything was given there. So today we pray to Sri Ramanujacharya for his mercy. All of these acharyas ultimately took shelter of Sriman Mahaprabhu, and Mahaprabhu accepted different facets of their teachings in his, in his continued line as part of the Madhva Sampradaya. So they're all, under, you know, they're all serving this same mission. Therefore, Ramanuja Acharya, we can learn from him unity and diversity. Ultimately, we are part of that same spiritual family, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, all souls are part of that same spiritual quality of Godhead. And therefore, 
At the same time, we are distinct. That is Vaishista Dvaitavad. Even though we are connected or one, we are still individual or distinct. Just like you can take a country, the United States of America, there are many states, but they are part of one country. India, many provinces, many cities, many towns, many people, but they are one country. So there's one absolute truth, but we're all part of that while maintaining our individual experience, individual qualities and in nature eternally. And our goal ultimately being attainment of service and relationship with the absolute truth. Vaishnavibhyo namo namaha.